I have this box of bunnies. Um, they're ceramic uh, and, and painted clay. Uh, they were my grandmother's. I gave them to her uh, each year for her birthday in April. Um, they definitely look like something that an old lady would put out in her house. Um, her birthday was close to Easter, so she would get the bunnies and she would always set them out, adding to her spring decor. Uh, when she died, I got the bunnies. They definitely don't fit our decor. They don't look like something people in their 30s would set out on display in their home. But every year around Easter, I unwrap them from their bubble wrap and I set them on the buffet, which was my grandparents that sits in our dining room. I do this to remember my grandmother. She's dead. I don't have any other way to know her presence. All I have is what I can remember. There's all kinds of ways that we go about this kind of memorializing. There's probably no state better at memorializing than Virginia. Um, the mother of presidents, we're sometimes called. A lot of work goes into restoring or preserving presidential estates. Mount Vernon, Monticello, Montpelier, Highland. You can visit there and learn about family legacy. You can see the pottery that they ate out of. You hear the stories of the enslaved people who worked the land. This is the only way we have to be connected to these leaders, this preservation, this memory, because they're dead. This is the only way we can know them. Since 1868, the United States has designated a day at the end of May to call Memorial Day a day to remember those who died in military service to the country. Research shows that this goes back to a woman named Mary Ann Williams, who came up with the idea of strewing graves of Civil War soldiers, both Union and Confederate soldiers, with flowers. And so today you'll find scout troops who go and put flags at graves. You'll have special services. And we hope that families who have known this loss of someone in service to the country will feel comfort in the acknowledgement that their person has been remembered. Because once that person is dead, the memory is all we have. We can often treat the church as though it is a memorial to Jesus. At Christmas, we remember how Jesus was born and laid in a manger. Uh, when we baptize someone into the faith, we remember how Jesus, too, was baptized. When we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we remember Jesus' last meal with his disciples, his commandment to love one another, how he died, and how he rose for us. We read the Bible to remember the story of Israel and of the church. We sing old hymns and we say old creeds to remember what the church has believed and said through the ages. It can feel like a lot of looking back, a lot of remembering and recalling. It's easy for this to become a preservation effort. But there's a wide gap between saying that Jesus rose from the dead and declaring Jesus is risen from the dead. There's a wide difference in just that verb tense, the past tense, versus the present tense. And it is the acknowledgement of the present tense, Jesus is risen, that we celebrate on Pentecost. Pentecost is not just remembering how the Holy Spirit was poured out on the disciples and the first followers of Jesus. It is the affirmation that the Holy Spirit continues to be poured out over us to equip and empower us to witness to the reign of Christ. Ours is not a religion where we try to preserve the legacy of a founder and model our life only after what he left behind. We follow a risen God who continues to work to empower the church. So we do not just remember, we participate. And that's hard. That's hard for us to trust and believe. Let's be honest. Whether we acknowledge it or not, we are all deeply, deeply shaped by the thinking of the Enlightenment, the very name of the period having a rather superior tone to it. Um, we are rational, 
scientific people. If something can't be seen, if it can't be measured, if it can't be tested, then it's not real. We find in other cultures, particularly in the global south, where this dominant enlightenment thinking didn't take as deep of a root, you'll hear testimonies to the powerful work of the Holy Spirit all the time. But in North Americans, we have a hard time often identifying the work of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't show up under a microscope. It can't be identified with meteorological instruments. It's not discovered in the human genome or under a brain scan. There's no test that can prove its existence, that this risen life in Christ is real and true. And so in our disbelief and in our misaligned viewpoints, there's a variety of ways that we respond to this discord. One of which is simply to dismiss the Christian message entirely as being primitive, um, unscientific, uh, superstition. You can track every Gallup poll and every Pew Research study that comes out every single year, and you will see that is now the prevailing answer for most people to whether or not the Christian message is true and the Spirit is active. We can call that the rejection approach. Another response is to create a morality out of the teachings of Jesus that we pass along to others. Christianity becomes a set of ethical principles and values. We go to Sunday school, we go to youth group, we go on mission trips to become good people. This is a memorialization in the religion. Seeing the teachings of Jesus is something we must preserve and then pass on to subsequent generations. Now, I don't want to dismiss or criticize this way of living the faith, but I do want us to acknowledge that this is mostly about preservation and about um, passing down this teaching more than it is about a living God who is blowing and moving through the church. We might call this approach the, um, the what would Jesus do Still, another response for people of faith is to take this morality approach and to expand it beyond personal decision-making and personal ethics into broader society. And how can we shape human society together after these teachings of Jesus and make them real? Advocacy for the poor, standing up for the rights of children, protecting the environment, working for peace in a time of war. This is the way that we take the life of Jesus, and we make it active in how we uh, legislate certain policies, who we elect to political office, what kind of nonprofits we invest our time and our energy in. This is how we enact and make the reign of Christ real. This approach um, is a manifestation of a, of a saying that you may have heard, um, that God's hand, yours are God's only hands and feet. The only feet and hands God has are yours. You've heard this before? What all of these approaches share, however, is a neglect of the third person of the Trinity. In each of these scenarios, we act and we decide, leaving no room for the Holy Spirit to show up and work. It's up to me to make moral decisions like Jesus would do if Jesus were here, but he's not. It's up to us to make real the teachings of Jesus in society. The best we have is a blueprint he gave us, but we're still the foremen, the masons, the electricians, the plumbers, etc., who have to bring it all to life. What might it look like, though, if we were to suspend our disbelief, to step out of our dominant enlightenment minds, and to squint into the mystery, to give in to imagination. Instead of relying on our willpower or our organizational structures or our persuasion, we trusted that the risen Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, is active and at work 
and empowering us and directing us toward a vision that is beyond what we could see through the unidentifiable power of grace. The key shift that happens within us when we step in faith into this spirit-led life is we come to see less our own abilities and instead we see the gifts of God within us. Just think for a minute about how you respond to a gift that you receive, a gift of love given by somebody who cares for you deeply. Perhaps every time you use or you pull out that gift, you recall the occasion that it was given, graduation or a wedding or a birthday or an anniversary. Maybe you talk about the person who gave the gift and what they meant in your life. Maybe you store it in a special way or in a special place so that you don't lose it, you don't have it to get broken. We all know the sinking feeling in our gut when we hear that crash, or we look over and we see the thing in the dog's mouth, and we go, oh no, that was a gift. The destruction, the loss of the gift feels like we have dishonored the giver. We also talk about gifts when we talk about um, artistic, athletic, or musical abilities, Lots of people learn to play instruments, they play sports, they take art classes. There are great teachers and coaches who can give you techniques and drills and teach you the rules and lead practices. But there are just some pupils who seem to have this ability that's beyond their own effort or even the coming together of their DNA, something beyond their humanity. Their coach, their teacher comes to them and says, you have a gift. And that drives this individual to develop and grow that gift because they know they have been given something rare, something precious. The difference in in these kinds of gifts and the gifts of the Spirit is that they aren't rare, but that they're poured out on everyone It's not restricted. It's not based on some kind of worthiness or ability. The Spirit of God gives a variety of gifts for the common good. That's what Paul tells the Corinthians. The Holy Spirit activates gifts in us for building up the church into the body of Christ. Now, Paul lays out some of those gifts in the passage that we read today, but it's not an exhaustive list. Wisdom and knowledge, faith, healing, powerful deeds, prophecy, discernment of spirits, speaking in tongues, interpreting tongues. What is consistent in all of these gifts is that they are not the possession of the one who receives the abilities, but they are to be entrusted to the person for the building up of the church, of the body of Christ, and through the church for the world. So on this Pentecost, I don't want you to remember that the Holy Spirit came on the disciples a long time ago. I want you to begin to trust that the Holy Spirit is working. You can know that Spirit through your abilities by coming to see them not as your possession, but as gifts from God. They are precious. Gifts from one who knows and cares and loves you to the core and who is accompanying and empowering your life. They are beyond something you could make for yourself. And so they cannot be treated with ambivalence or lethargy. For the Holy Spirit is upon you. You have been given gifts. How then will you use them?